Can you love God and not obey God? Interesting question. In today's lesson entitled, Love and Obey God, Moses challenges Israel to not only obey God, but to love God. Join me as we deal with this. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandment. That's a very powerful statement for someone to say. The question was asked, can you love God and not obey God? The answer would really have to be no, because loving and obeying kind of goes hand to hand. And if you can really understand what I'm saying, to love someone is to reverence to, and to give them the love, the honor, and the respect, and even the obedience that uh, it's due to them. But if you don't love them, it becomes very difficult to obey them. And many today don't love God, and it's in the proof of the fact that they don't obey God. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sunday School Lesson as taught by Elder Rodney Jones. We go over the International Standard Lesson verse by verse keywords and key phrases. This is not the Union Gospel lesson. We will post the Union Gospel lesson possibly tomorrow. This is the International Standard lesson. Today's topic is love and obey God. We're in Deuteronomy the sixth chapter, verses one through nine. The date for discussion is December the 2nd, 2018. Take a moment if you can and will, hit the subscribe button below and the bell symbol that's beside it so that YouTube will let you know each week as we upload these lessons. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, Thou and thy son and thy son's son all the days of thy life and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house, and on thy gates. This is the reading of our entire lesson. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word for the edification of our souls and the people of God said, Amen. Israel is at a point they have already seen the handwork of God. First of all, they have been wandering already in the wilderness 
and those that were above them, that were 20 and up, had already died because they rejected, they disobeyed God, they murmured against God, and a whole lot of other things. So they were not found worthy by God to enter into the promised land. If you remember just a few verses ago, a couple chapters ago, they were meeting God, and God came down by fire, by smoke, by thunder, and by lightning, by earthquake, mountains quake, and everything. And Israel said, Lord, we don't want to deal with you. So they called Moses to be the spokesman. Moses and God communicates. Moses comes back, sends them home, and then also he gives them the commandment or the covenant. Many don't realize that the Ten Commandments is really one commandment, and it's a covenant that God made with Israel. And so now in today's lesson, Moses is reiterating some things that took place. So the lesson opens up, and it says, Now, now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach. He commanded Moses to teach them. Because remember, Israel said that they can't deal with God on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so now Moses is the mediator between God and Israel. So he says these are, he names three things. I won't get into the technicality of a commandment, a statute, and a judgment. But yes, they are different at times and sometimes they're used interchangeably. But they are, at times, they stand on their own feet. I don't want to get too deep in that because it will really pull us from the lesson. So he mentions that these are three things. The commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, he says, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. That you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it. Notice it's not the land that they're in, but this is for the land that they're going to possess. Notice what Moses says. He says, God told me to teach you, to teach you his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments that you can obey them in the land that you go to. So it's, it's very important because number one, Moses was given the authority, the power, and the commandment. Moses said, God commanded me to teach you. And I remember reading that Israel was in trouble because Israel did not have a teaching priest. I know we're in the land of many gifts operating, but we can never lose the gift of teaching. That is a valuable, important gift that must at all times operate in the church. Even Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things. Not preaching them, but teaching them to observe all all things whatsoever I command you, and lo, I am with you always. So Moses says, he commanded me to teach you so that you will obey them in the land, which means if Moses didn't teach them, they would not be able to obey in the land because they wouldn't have a knowledge. How many people out there are lost and don't have a knowledge because someone refused to teach them? and we were commanded to put the hanky down, open up your Bible, and teach the Word of God so that the people may know what is required of them to do by God. Now, he uses two words, and I love these words, and in your Bibles you'll see that the word LORD is all capital, capital L-O-R-D. I mention this from time to time because we always have uh, new viewers and new subscribers. Looking in your Bible, you see where the word uh, Lord is all capital L-O-R-D, and that word means the self-existent one. Because everyone exists because God exists, or we all exist because God causes us to exist. But God is the source of existing. <laughs> he is the existence of existment. I'm gonna leave that in there. So he is the self-existent one. There's no one who created God. There is no beginning, no ending to God. He has always, he will always, and he has always been forever. There is no beginning, no ending to him. Sounds like a tongue twister, but I'm going to still move on. So he used the term Lord. It means the self-existent one or one or he that makes 
covenants and keeps the covenant. He's the self-existent one that makes and keeps covenant. But then he says, the Lord, your God. Now remember, the word God is used uh, in the plural. It is Elohim in the plural, and it is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not three gods, but one God uh, eternally existing in three persons or three characteristics or three characters, uh, for the lack of a better word, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because remember, in the beginning, God spoke it, and Jesus is the word who performed it, and the Holy Spirit moved over the face of the earth. That's one God, three existence or three persons, three personalities, three distinct characters or characteristics. But it's interesting because he said he is your God. He is the triune God or another term for it would be he is the majestic one or he is the very one who created the heaven and the earth. That's interesting and powerful to them because, remember, Israel just got out of slavery. They had been enslaved for 400 and some years. Then they went through the wilderness for 40 years. And now the same God who created the heaven, the earth, the moon, the stars, and man is the same God who is the Lord over Israel. Moses said a whole mouthful. I'm going to move on. Said so number two, he says, uh, I'm supposed to teach you and that you would do this in the land. Number two says that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep, to keep, fear the Lord to keep all his statutes and his commandments. Now, I'm just going to throw this in here. At first, he says commandments, statutes, and judgments. When you get to verse 2, he just mentions statutes and commandments. And I want to let you know that there's a slight difference in definition on verse 2 of the word statues and verse 1 statues. It says that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all the statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou, thy son, thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Now, he says, he's told me to do this so that you can keep this in the land so that you can also fear the Lord. Fear the Lord and keep, fear him and keep all of his statutes, not just one. We cannot pick, choose, and select which one we do and do not want. Moses said, you got to come and you got to do it all. You can't break not one part of God's statutes or God's commandments. But then he says something. He says, not only you, but your son, your son's son, and so on and so forth. Now, it could be the male gender, because the man at that time was a very valuable, the man was the strength of the community. And so he would bear children or beget children and teach his children. His children's son would get married, have a family. He would raise his family with the same type of teaching, the same type of doctrine. Now, he says the purpose for him teaching the law, number one, is so that Israel will fear the Lord thy God and keep his statutes and his commandments. Number two, the purpose for the teaching of the law, he says, is so that they would teach them to their sons, their sons' sons, or their children, or their offsprings. Purpose number three for Moses teaching them the law is so that they were to instruct them all the days of their life. Don't just teach them the day and tomorrow and be done, but they were to teach them from birth all the way to death. Then he says the purpose of all this is so that you might have a prolonged life. Two things I want to say about that. Israel's prosperity is hinged on their total obedience to God's law. Say that again. Israel's prosperity, the wealth and all of that that Israel is going to be getting in the promised land is hinged on their total obedience to God's law. Number two, Israel's posterity, her posterity. First one is prosperity, prosperous. The other one is posterity, the prolonging of the life. Having more children 
is hinged on her total obedience to God's law as well. He says, keep his statutes and commandments so that your days may be prolonged. Now, I don't believe he's talking about a personal day. I believe he's talking about Israel as a nation. If Israel keeps God's statutes, let's just say if Israel keeps God's laws or obey uh, God, then Israel will remain as a nation and they will be growing in the promised land. We saw that because when they stopped keeping God's word, they went into slavery and they were captured and taken away. He uses the word fear, that thou mayest fear. And fear is a verb meaning to respect or to reverence. And we will go with the word reverence, to be afraid. Uh, when we fear God, we obey God. When we fear God, we obey God. When we don't fear God, we don't always obey God. I have to say that because there are many who don't fear God, but at times they might obey God. But when you fear God, you obey God. Matter of fact, you live a life of obedience to God. And there is a great reward in fearing God and in obeying God. Let's look at the word keep. The word keep means to preserve, to guard, to be careful, to watch over, to watch carefully over, or to be on one's guard. I'm going to go with the word to preserve, to preserve. Not only did he say that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, but he also said to keep all his statutes, to preserve it. And, and, and watch why I say this. How does one preserve the statutes and the laws of God? When According to how Moses told them, when you, who I'm talking to, teach it to your sons, your son's son, your son's son's son, and every generation, that's the art of preserving. That's how you preserve. That's how we got a lot of history, because one generation kept it. They preserved it. They guarded it. They watched over it, and they passed it down from one generation to the other. My question for you, I want you to ask your students and then those who are watching, I want you to write in the comment section below. How does teaching the law of God bring the fear of God? How does teaching the law of God bring the fear of God? Because Moses says, I'm teaching you this so that you will fear God. I'm teaching you the commandments, the laws, and the judgments of God so that you can fear God. How does teaching the law of God bring the fear of God? And not only do I want you to write your answer down, now whatever your answer may be, it's your own personal answer. Uh, ask your students, when you go to your various classes, ask your students, and if you can share with us, the viewers, what were some of their answers I would love to hear how does teaching the law of God bring the fear of God. Look at verse 3. He says, Hear therefore, O Israel. Now, the word therefore is really important because it's hinged on verses 1 and 2 at least. It may be hinged on other uh, passages of Scripture further up. But we're going to just hang glide right here on the actual lesson. Here, therefore, or because of what I just got through telling you, because of the benefits, the longevity, the prosperity, and all that that you will receive, the milk and the honey, he says, I need you to do two things, to hear and to observe. Now, remember, the word hear doesn't mean just to incline the ear, but it means to incline the ear to hearken, to listen diligently to with the intent of on uh, submitting to what's being heard, respecting what's being heard, and obeying what has been told you to do if there were any instructions. So he says here, I want you to listen to what's going on with the intent of obeying what has been said, O Israel, and then observe it. I need you to obey it. I need you to carefully do what has been said for you to do. He says that it may be well with you. Now, if you don't do it, then it won't be well with you. The answer is yours. If you want it to be well with you, hear what I got to tell you and do it. 
that it may be well with you, and that you might increase uh, mightily. And Israel grew and they increased mightily. We saw that throughout scripture and God did promise Abraham that his family would be a very large family. He wouldn't be able to, if he could count the dust or the stars and all of that, he said, then you can count the number of your children. But Abraham couldn't do it. And so neither can we even this day. We don't know how many Jews there are. But he says, as the Lord God of thy fathers have promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Now, this land that's flowing with uh, milk and honey is the land of Canaan. This is where Israel came from. When uh, Jacob left Canaan, I believe it was, it was 70 souls. They left there going to Egypt because of the famine in the land. At that time, Joseph will already be there because his brothers had sold him. They will stay there 400 to 430 years. They will be afflicted with pain, punishment, taken into slavery, murdered the whole nine yards, but they came out with great substance because God promised Abraham that that's what would happen. And he told them this land. So this land has been since day one been called the promised land. But this land now is flowing with milk and it's flowing with honey. Two things. Milk comes from cattle, but honey possibly comes from as a natural resources of the land. Now, if Israel will, if they will hear, or if they will do two things, hear and observe, then two things will happen. It will be well with them, and they will increase mightily in the land. Uh, remember, this land is flowing with milk and honey. Uh, this will be some natural stuff that will be coming. It would be palatious. It would be flowing. Not just have it, but it would be flowing with milk and honey. And also remember, Israel just come out of uh, 400 some years of slavery. They don't know nothing about living the life. They don't know nothing about flowing because they were slaves. They were beaten and they were murdered and trampled on and stepped on, but God pulled them out and he's going to literally take care of them like babies if they would just obey his word. Then he says, hear, O Israel. This is where we get the word Shema. Shema. Some call it Shema. The word I believe is called Shema. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. Now, for the understanding of this one Lord, it's not saying one as in one, two, three, four, as in a number count. But what it's really saying is he is God only or he is the only God. He is the only Lord. In other words, there is no other God other than him. There's none before him. This is the same God that created the heaven, the earth, the man, the moon, the stars, the sun, the day, the light, the great and the, the lesser light. This is the same God, he says, and, and this is the same God that brought you through the wilderness, that did the ten plagues upon Pharaoh and the Egyptian. This is the same God that calls the Jordan River and the other uh, river to flow and to back up. This is the same God that did that, that caused the sun and the moon to stand still. This is the same God. It was not different God. This is the same God that fed you the manna while you were in the wilderness so that you wouldn't be hungry. This is the same God that when you were thirsty gave you water out of a rock. This is the same God that allowed you to go 40 years on the same shoes without them running over. And these ain't even good years. Come on somebody, this was a 40 year. Come on, somebody, this is the same God. So he says he is one Lord, or he is one God, or he is the only God. There is none other than him. You don't have to worry about many gods. Everything you need is comprised in this one God. He says, now, here he's one God, and you are to love him with all your heart, your soul, and your might. He mentions three things. The heart would be the inner person. The soul is a feminine noun, meaning the breath, the inner being with its thoughts and emotions. And the might would be your power and all of your will. In other words, there's nothing left. When you get with the heart, 
the soul, and the might, or even all of your strength. In other words, your very existence, he says you ought to love the Lord with everything you got from within and also from without because you are serving the only and the true and living God. He says, in these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. Why your heart? Because your heart is the seat of your intellect. Your heart is the seat of your motive. Your heart is the seat of your intentions uh, of doing right or doing wrong. Your heart is the seat of your very decisions, your thoughts. When you contemplate doing right or wrong, it comes from the heart. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And I want to say something, that when man has the seed of God in the heart of man, then man has God within him. In other words, does God have a seat in your heart? If God has a seat in your heart, then your decisions are godly. Your thoughts are godly. Your intents are godly. Your intentions are godly. Your, 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 your focus is godly. Your communication is godly. Your walk and your view and your talk and everything you do is God because you're doing it from a place that everything comes from, but God is the center of attraction and God is the one that's sitting in your heart. In other words, when God is there, your heart is pure. Come on, somebody. Verse 7 says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them, what? The laws, the commandments, and the statutes. When thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Now, in Hebrew, this is called the extremity, to go from one extreme to the other. He says, teach them diligently to your children. Uh, talk of them when you're sitting in the house and when you're walking or when you're standing or when you're laying down or when you're in the front or when you're in the back. In other words, when you go from one extreme to the other and anything that's included. So if you're lying down for in the evening and then you're waking up the next, you are to be teaching it and talking it to your children at all times is what he's saying. Now you look at the word, teach them diligently. It means to pierce, to pierce, to pierce, to sharpen. In other words, it means to teach the laws of God to your children in such a way until it literally pierces the heart, sharpens and pierces the heart. So that when they get of age and leave home, it will be still pierced in their heart, not on the negative, but on the positive. And they will constantly remember the teaching and pass it on. They would preserve it and observe it and hear it. Then verse 8 says, And thou shalt bind them, bind them, tie them up, bind them uh, for a sign upon thy hand. Bind them in your hand. And they should be as frontless between thine eyes. I believe if the Jew had a box that he would have a band and it would be like what's called a frontlet. And they would have scriptures in there that he would, pop, uh, would read. Uh, and he said, if you would take this, I believe, figuratively, then with the Jew it may be uh, for real too. But if I can use figuratively, take it and put it in frontlets and constantly read it. And if you constantly read it, it's forever in your view, it's forever in your thoughts, it's forever in your mind. You will constantly do it. And then verse 9 says, and thou shalt write. Now you're going to be writing them. Write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. So not only do you talk them to your children and teach them diligently to your children, teach them when they're waking up and when they're laying down, talk to them when you're walking by the roadside, talk to them when you're waking them up, getting them ready for college, for elementary, for grammar school, uh, shut the TV off, teach the children because they need to know our children in this day don't know God and I blame the parent because we don't take time to teach our children about God. We spend more time on the internet and Facebook in church and our children are on Facebook in church. How do I know? Because I'm a preacher and when I walk past to go into the pulpit, I see our children and people's grandchildren and great grandchildren playing games and all of that when they should be worshiping God. Then when they get in trouble, who do they call on? You got it. 
So he says, write them on the gates and the, the posters of your door. Write them on your front door, your back door, your side door. Write them on the gates. That way you will be constantly reminded of the laws, the statutes, and the judgments of God so that you will have posterity and prosperity, longevity in your life. As you go to your classes, let your uh, classroom know that they should love God and they should obey God and let them know that it's very difficult for them to obey God if they don't love God. First thing needs to happen is they need to love God, but let them see us loving God so that they can know what loving God looks like and let them know that when they love God, they will obey God. And Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I read one scripture where it says, his commandments are not grievous. See, when you love a thing, you don't mind doing for that thing or going out your way for it because you love it. I'll say this right quick. When my wife was pregnant, she wanted some Chinese food and I walked a few blocks in a snow blizzard just because she had a craving for Chinese food because I loved her. Not because she was getting on my nerve, but because I loved her. Don't tell her. So that's how... That's how we ought to do it. We ought to do it and obey God, not because just because it was written, but because we love it. And God will bless us because we're doing it from the abundance of our heart. That's it. Remember my motto, teaching the word of God in the spirit of excellence. And the Sunday school motto, a child saved is a soul saved plus a life. Amen. <laughs>